Hi, welcome to chapter four of Internment by Samira Ahmed. I'm Miss Valley. Hope everyone is doing well. Chapter four. <clears throat> Ten minutes. That's how long we've been given to pack up our lives, to leave our home, to prepare for relocation. How do we even begin? It's not even time enough to say goodbye. Suit number one's voice blasts at us as we begin to walk upstairs to collect our things. Only the necessities, one bag per person. He turns away, stops, and yells back, Guards are posted in the front and back. My parents and I continue up the stairs quietly. There are no more words. I feel like a fish that's been caught on a line and slapped onto a stone. My tail flaps, my body lurches. I'm about to be gutted, and all I can do is watch the knife coming for me. My dad silently ushers all of us into my room. My eyes scan this space, and suddenly it feels like it's not my own, not the place I've spent every night for over a decade. The book left open on my bed, the disheveled conda quilt, the long black cotton scarf with red roses embroidered on it, my phone plugged into the nightstand. My phone. David, I need to tell him. I stutter step toward the, my phone. Boots stomp up the stairs. No. My mom whispers, snatching my phone from my hands. There's no time to protest, let alone tap out a text. I can only watch, wide-eyed, as my phone falls to the ground, hitting the carpet with a soft thud and a bounce that lands it on the bare wood floor underneath my bed. I drop to my knees to reach for it amid the dust and detritus. I'll take your phones now. I look up. It's the boots. A man in a khaki army uniform steps into my room, hand extended. His jaw juts out showcasing a prominent underbite. My dad reaches into his pocket and turns over his phone. He doesn't make eye contact with the guard or with me or my mom. My, my phone. Mom stumbles over her words then clears her throat. It's on the small table in the foyer. She takes my dad's hand and they step a little closer to me. My mom reaches for me. I take her hand and let her pull me to standing. She nods at me. I look down at my phone, the bejeweled rubber case, the scratches on the glass surface, the screensaver of David and me, a selfie of us on a hike not far from here. His arm is around my shoulders. I'm flashing a peace sign and we both have goofy grins on our faces. There's a tightness in my chest. There's a deep coldness in my bones and my blood is like ice. My mom turns to me and carefully unwraps each of the fingers that clutch my phone. My knuckles are white. Without another word, she gives my phone to the guard. Ten minutes, the guard barks at us, and then turns and walks out the door. My dad pauses, then quietly shuts the door. We're alone, the three of us, in my room. I burst into tears. My parents surround me, wrapping their arms around each other and me. One of them kisses the top of my head. I'm not sure who. The other kisses my forehead. I don't know anything anymore. I don't even know if this is real. I can't feel my body. It's like I'm watching all of this from outside myself. And it seems like I should be, and it seems like it should be science fiction. We only have a few minutes, my dad says, his voice cracking as he releases us from his embrace. Take what you think you'll need, Beta, my mom says, stepping back. A vice grips my heart. What I need? I need all the things I can't have. My dad takes my mother's free hand. They look at me, ashen-faced, red-eyed. They are about to walk out, but my mom returns to me, grabs my hand, and motions for my dad to take the other. In this small circle of our family, my mom turns first to me, then my dad, silently, her eyes glistening with tears. She starts to whisper a prayer. My Arabic isn't so good, besides memorizing duas for daily prayers. But this one I know, because it was always on Nani's lips. She even carried a copy of this verse in her purse on a little laminated card. The verse of the throne, the protection prayer. My Nani used to tell me that this was one of the most powerful verses of the Quran, that whoever recited this verse would be under God's protection. My dad once told me about the poetic symmetry of the verse. You should imagine yourself walking through the verse, he said, stopping at the chasmus, the middle line. He knows that which 
is in front of them and that which is behind them. When you read the four lines before and the four lines after, you'll see how, thematically, they are concentric circles that loop around the middle line. I may not be the most stalwart of Muslims, and my practice may waver, but this dua, maybe because of how I remember Nani reciting it as she would blow the, can the, blow the prayer over me, this one always gives me a sense of calm. But something more, too. Like my Nani's voice endowed each of the words with the strength of her belief, like the words were tangible. I reach out for that peace right now, that strength, but it feels like grasping at air. We have to hurry, my dad says when my mom finishes the short verse. Can you do this, my mom asks. Do you need me to help you? No, I want to say, I can't do this, I won't. My heart is breaking, but underneath there's this flickering flame of fury too. How can we do this? How can you go along with this? I want to yell at my parents, but I whisper. I don't understand how this is happening. My voice is barely a scratch. How can we be dangerous to the state? A poet, a chiropractor, and a high school senior? It's not about danger. It's about fear. People, people are willing to trade their freedom, even for a false sense of protection. My dad shakes his head. There was never a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. What does that even mean? Behind the terror, I can feel the flames of anger burning, rising. How can we resign ourselves to this? It's John Adams. He meant democracy is fragile. All we can do right now is go along. My dad turns to the window and raises his eyebrows. They've stationed police outside the door. If we don't cooperate, it will be much, much worse for all of us. Hurry, Beta, my mom says as she and my dad rush out to pack the, up their lives and suitcases. My head spins. My chest rises and falls, which is the only way I know I'm still breathing and standing here in the middle of the room. My bed's not made. I can't leave without making my bed. Who cares about the bed? Why didn't I text David? Does he know? How am I supposed to leave here without telling him? Will he think I've disappeared? Suit number one told us where we were going, a rel relocation center near Manzanar. He used Manzanar like a landmark, like the word was so every day, like sun and grass and sky, words you would use a million times without thinking, like the irony wasn't lost on him because our world has no more irony in it. Only minutes are left and I have to figure out what to take, but for how long, a couple of days, a month? The Japanese Americans were interned until World War II ended. Years. Crap, could it be years? I grab the biggest duffel I have and start filling it with jeans, t-shirts, socks, underwear, pajamas. My black hoodie is zip-up fleece. How cold does it get? Shoes. What shoes? A hat, gloves. What do I need? How am I supposed to do this? Books. We can have books, right? I grab a couple of books from my nightstand, knocking over a digital frame currently displaying a picture of David and me at homecoming. I pick it up and hold it to my chest. I feel giant sobs coming on again, but I can't. I don't have time. I put the frame back on my nightstand, not sure if they'll allow pictures at uh, wherever they're taking us. What if they confiscate it? I'd rather have it here, at home, safe, intact. From my desk, I snatch a handful of pens and a blank notebook. There's a knock on my door. My mom. Dad's downstairs. We have to go. I'm not ready. This is mad. I can't go. Mom. My voice breaks. She moves towards me, but I hold up my palm and she stops. Make sure you remember socks and underwear. She gives me a small, wan smile. Socks and underwear. I wonder if all moms do this, try to make the terrifying seem mundane. She steps away. She knows that I need a moment. I look around the room. There's a little bit of space left in my duffel, so I take some rolls of washi tape and a blank journal I got in Paris last summer. The cover has a drawing of a girl and her dog curled up on a giant pot of red jam. I glance at my bookshelf, the yearbooks, my shoebox of notes and cards from David. I saved 
every note David ever passed me in school. He laughed and called me a romantic when I asked him to write me notes instead of texting. But I love the notes. Each one is a little gift, a tangible surprise that doesn't eat up gigs on my phone. And now I'm leaving them forever? For someone else to look at? What happens to our house? Will it be searched? Is it still ours? Too many questions and no answers. And I desperately want to take that box with me, but there's no room and no time. A door shuts downstairs and my mom calls up for me. I pick up my duffel and turn off the light. But before I shut the door, I go back and straighten the quilt on my bed. I see Fluffy, a brown stuffed dog with one ear almost falling off, who joined me on my first day of nursery school. It was the only way I'd allow my parents to leave. He made me feel secure. My impulse is to take him, but I leave Fluffy on my pillow where he has spent thousands of nights in a place that once was safe. I stomp down the stairs. I reach into my pocket and instinct to grab the phone that isn't there. I clench my empty hand into a fist and a tear plops onto my knuckle. What would I text David even if I had a chance? Goodbye? I love you? Find me? I meet my parents in the foyer. There are a million shards in my heart, but the one that really stabs is having my damn phone taken away. Maybe it's dumb to think of it this way, but it's not only my phone. It's all my pictures, every memory of school and tennis team and David. I stifle my sobs. Dread clutches me. But so does anger. They didn't merely take my phone. They took my voice, my choice. An invisible hand pushes us outside the door. The nights are so quiet here. That's one thing I always liked about our little town. The crickets in the summer, the trees whispering on the breeze. You can actually see the stars, but not tonight. Tonight, there is only dark sky. I take a last look inside. A guard has his hand on our doorknob, on our door. He's going to pull it closed, but the dishes, are there still dishes in the sink? I can't remember if we loaded the dinner plates into the dishwasher. Will someone do the dishes? My mom hates leaving dishes overnight. The door slams behind us. My parents don't even look. I swing my head around. There are cars at the curb, the van we saw earlier, and more exclusion guards. The suits. The suits are conferring with the chief of police. There is talking around me. I hear words, but the words don't make any sense. Like everyone is speaking in tongues. My parents shuffle me into the back seat of the, poli of the chief of police's car and shut the door. There's no air. I try to open the door, but apparently you can't open the back seat doors from the inside of a police car. So I watch as my parents exchange words with suit number one, who hands them some papers. Then they turn to the chief, who is also has something to say, but seems to be having a hard time looking my parents in the eye. We know the chief. We've known him since his daughter Ivy and I were in kindergarten together. My dad nods. My mom stares at him blankly. Then the chief opens the back door for them and they slide in next to me. I move over to make some space. We don't look at one another. We don't say anything. It's like we're all in mourning, but for different things in our own way. The chief starts up the car. I see something, someone running toward us. I squint into the darkness. I can't see. David. Could it be David? Does he know? Does he see me? The chief pulls the car away from the curb. I yell David's name, but the chief doesn't respond. It's like no one can hear me. I strain to see, but the chief has the light on inside the car, and all I can see is the reflection of a girl who doesn't really look like me. I try to roll the window down, but it won't roll down. I look at the girl in the window. Her face is puffy and red, and her watery reflection looks like a ghost. I look at my parents. They're ghosts, too. The world has shattered, and all that's left is this alternate universe full of broken people with nothing to hold on to. And that's the end of Chapter 4. Be sure to go on Google Classroom and answer today's question. Have a good one.